So let's go into the carbon budget framing first. And so I don't know what you know about this, so maybe this is something you're quite familiar with. Just think of this graphically. So we've got some emissions going up here. This is carbon dioxide at the side and, and the years out at the bottom. So we've got emissions going up here. Um, this is just stylistic at the moment. And what really matters is the area under the curves. The this is our total amount of carbon dioxide. Remember, when we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide will be there probably, it'll be there for centuries. Some of it will be there for a thousand and more years. For many realistic sense, carbon dioxide is permanent in our atmosphere. Some of it gets pulled out quite quickly, but there's a buildup of the part that doesn't. And that gets built up year after year. And that's the problem with climate change. It's a cumulative problem. So every year you fail, it is much more difficult to solve the following year. So what happens down here doesn't really matter. What matters is the area under the curve. So if we choose to fail, so in Sweden, they're looking to expand our under airport, another airport up north. You've now got a liquid natri uh, um, liquefied natural gas terminal being planned for, for Gothenburg. So Sweden is planning to maximize its CO2 emissions. Um, by doing that, then we make sure we don't stay within the budget, which means that the future generations, because it's not us, it's future generations, will then have to suck more CO2 out of the system one way or another. In other words, their mitigation rates have to be much higher. And I'll come back later and say that simply won't be possible. So our choice to fail today is locking in the future. We cannot say, well, just do easy incremental things today and then we'll solve the problem later. That doesn't work on climate change because the science doesn't allow it. So let's try and frame the mitigation challenge. Um, so we've got this 1.5 and 2 degrees C of warming. As I say, this relates to sort of sets of impacts. And if you plot them out at a global level, I'm not going to go into the detail here, it looks something like this. And actually, there's not a lot of variation in this because there's so little carbon budget left because we've deliberately chosen to waste the carbon budget over the last 27 years. There's almost nothing left. So that's, that's the carbon budget here. And if you start to look at these curves, as I say, you can't make the curves go this way because that would mean the carbon budget is too big. If the carbon budget is too big, then we have a much higher temperature. So we're stuck by the carbon budget. Then for, for, for two degrees centigrade, by about 2036, the midway through the 2030s, we have to be reducing at about 11% every single year. So just think about that in your own lives. That is just an enormous change. And we have to get up there quite quickly. So we start ramping up quite quickly to this level. And for 1.5 degrees centigrade, that poorer, you know, poorer, very low emitting countries have, have requested and we've agreed to try and help them with, we need about 20% per annum during the 2030s. Now, remember, this is at a global level, and the equity component requires us in the wealthy parts to lead on this. So it would be much more challenging that than that for Sweden or for the U European Union, for instance. But when you look at the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, all the other numbers are taken from what's called Working Group 1, which is basically just the science. So the IPCC, are you all familiar with the IPCC? Okay, so the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which collect together all the science data, um, it has different working groups, and working group one is basically just, the, if you like, the nearest thing we have to the physics. So it's just people with white coats doing physics. It's not quite that simple, but it's a bit like that. Working group three is the mitigation scenario, uh, mitigation group that look at how we solve the problems, and that's highly politicised, and it only has one particular way of looking at these things. Um, in my view, it shouldn't be part of the IPCC. But this is, the, this is the median values from working group three, which is dominated by economists with some engineers, but dominated by economists. So they look at a much more attractive curve. It dramatically reduces the mitigation challenge. So as a policymaker or as a, as a citizen, we might think that's much more attractive. It offers um, nice narratives about how we can make incremental nudge type changes to solve problems of climate change. But it's built on a complete utopian alliance of technology and economics. And no one I know who, are, who works in these models thinks that they're viable. They're politically suitable for now, but they won't work. So the science is telling us this, and the economists are telling us that. And how are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because they've conjured up a new technology that doesn't exist. And it's these negative emission technologies. And there are virtually no exceptions to this in the major advice that's given to governments from working group three, from this group of particular modelers. So they're going to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, not they, of course, the next generation, rather, will suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the future to compensate for the fact that we aren't prepared to make the changes today. And it doesn't even finish at the end of the century. What they require, because we're not going to make these changes, is actually this goes on way into the next century. So we're locking the future into this because of our choice to fail today. And the, the net, the negative, there's quite a lot of acronyms in, in climate change. I think it's to stop other people understanding it. So the net, the negative emission technology that dominates the models, the only one in the models, is something called BECS. Have you ever heard of this? 
So this, this is really fundamental to understand why it is the message from most scientists is so upbeat, or at least it's not so downbeat, perhaps, on climate change. And in, in Sweden, Johan Rockström would, would, you know, has a lot of this technology in his advice to governments, in the papers that he's been involved with. Um, so it's, the most common one is biomass energy with carbon capture and storage, BEX. And in this, what we're going to do is we're going to grow trees and plants around the world. And as they grow, they suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through the normal processes of photosynthesis. We then capture these, we chop them down, we transport them all around the world in an infrastructure that is about as big as current world shipping. shipping. This isn't in the models. They don't, they've never put the detail in the models. So you have a new shipping industry that's as large as current world shipping that transports this biomass around the world. It is then burnt in power stations and you capture the carbon dioxide and then it goes up the chimney, the waste carbon, the carbon. So the carbon dioxide is sucked out by the plant. You then capture it as it goes up the chimney. You liquefy it and then you pump it through some pipes a few hundred kilometers and you store it deep underground for a few thousand years. So this is what we're relying on in every single model advising governments. And a lot of the policymakers aren't aware and that's certainly the journalists very often aren't. Let's also be clear, this has never worked at scale. We do not have an example of this working on any power station anywhere in the world. There are massive technical and economic unknowns. You know, burning coal and capturing the carbon is quite difficult. And we've only done that in one power station in Canada so far. And that was a very small power station and it's proved really difficult. Here we're going to burn biomass and capture the carbon. That is even more challenging. So massive technical and economic unknowns, a huge efficiency penalty. So probably somewhere between 15 and 25% less efficient because you have to do this process as well. And there's limited biomass availability. The aviation industry wants to run its, its planes on biomass. The shipping industry wants to run its ships on biomass. We already have about 5 to 7% of our car fuel running on biomass. And we want to feed 9 billion people. And perhaps it would be nice to have some parts of the planet that weren't there just for our immediate use, where you could actually have natural, natural parks or forests and things that weren't there just to help us. So all of that. And this is... I mean, the, yeah. Använd mikrofonen, annars hörs det inte på. Ja, det här är så komplicerade termer, så du får översätta Absolut. Alltså jag undrar, är det verkligen, stor, hur stor del är det BEX man pratar om i de här IPCC-scenarierna? Är det inte först och främst nu CCS? Och det är väl ändå en teknik som är mer nära till hans och som man skulle kunna koppla på egentligen vart enda kolkraftverk och stålkraftverk. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah. So, um, how much is is it just Bex? How much is it also stuff like uh, carbon capture and storage, which could be used at coal power plants now? Yeah. Well, I will. This slide and the next slide, I hope, will will clarify this. So, this is this is these are the scenarios going into the IPCC for a likely chance, of, so a reasonable chance of two degrees centigrade. So, these are the scenarios here, and these are the ones that work out amount of bioenergy, and most of this is Bex. Across the, across the century. So if you look here, by about 2050, 2060, this is the range we assume will be working. And the, notice there are virtually no models that don't assume this. Virtually every model has it in. And this may not mean much to you. It's about 200 to 300 exajoules after 2060. That's about half of current energy demand. So imagine all of the world's energy today, that half of that comes from burning plants. That's what we're planning for this century. So. Across the 21st century, a quarter to a half of future energy will come from burning plants and burying CO2. And that's in every model. 